there, trust me. You know when you hear a beat and you're just like, I'm gonna go mad on this. Everyone keeps asking me for these lyrics, man. Like, first I was just doing it for nothing. I thought, oh, give me 20p and I'll do well in it. Like, hustle for that. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that, that's just how it went, man. Do you know what I mean? Like, hustling for music. And that's that's where the whole Harry Shotter name even came from. Shotting lyrics. It's not it's not shotting anything else. It's shotting lyrics. It's shotting bars. You know what I'm saying? So it comes from the childhood. It comes from that background of kind of shotting lyrics in the playground to now shotting lyrics on a live stage to a live audience. You know what I mean? Pugilistic, so super sick with the mystic art form data collection, no restriction, bun your statistics, more to the tracks and streaming stats. I'm... I just listened to it so much and I loved it so much that I became the student of it. You know what I'm saying? It's like if you if you if you're if you if it's kung fu and you just do it every day, all day, and you just love it and you've got a passion for it, you're gonna end up in the field of kung fu, innit? And that's what I kind of done with barring and MC, and it was just it was just natural that I was gonna kind of end up in this space, man. Demon map when I kick the ballistic, solistic journalist when I spit this specialist skill, ridiculous fitness, cardio, muscular murder witness. No, it can't be me forever. It can't, you know, it can't be that skip a shabba forever. Do you know what I mean? We need your wisers and all these new people coming through with the talent and and that will carry it through to the next generation because that's the thing. The youngers want to see people of their own age as well. They respect the olders, obviously. They respect the elders and the legends, but they naturally want to see people who are their age as well representing this music. Otherwise, otherwise the music just dies out. It becomes like an old man's music, isn't it? Do you know what I'm saying? Um, Death control is alien, crush a cranium in the stadium, place the palladium with titanium. I'm the omen, call me Damien. This gymnasium is my dojo. Combinations, I bring a daze in them. Raising them up with the flow's amazing them. Drop bro, VP, back to blazing them. Music is the energy, the source. It's, it's everything. I can't, li I can't not listen to music for too long because I start to get a bit pissed off. I like, like I have to have it. It's like it's a food. It's it's an energy. It's 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 a source of like keeping me personally going. And now a lot of people can relate to that as well. Man, I'm moving on mad with the wordplay. Man, I'm moving on Mazza. Got away with these words. Ain't nobody out here badder. Dangerous when I do my thing. And now we're sounding all madder. My pen game is sharp. Still that don da don da don dada. Man, I'm moving on mad with the wordplay. Man, I'm moving on Mazza. Got away with these words. Ain't nobody out here badder. Dangerous when I do my thing. And now we're sounding all madder. My pen game is sharp. Still that don da don da don. Hello and welcome to another episode of the One More Thing podcast, a place strictly saved for the deepest conversations with the most inspiring minds and talents in bass music and sound system culture with me, Dave Colombo Jenkins. Recently, over the last few episodes, we've been lurking around the world of hip hop to acknowledge the big 50 year celebrations that were happening in New York in August. Exploring the many parallels that can be found, the dots that can be joined between hip hop and electronic music, most notably drum and bass. In the last few episodes, we've spoken to Mr. Formula, Armani Rain, and now the one and only Harry Shotter. No introduction to this monster microphone maverick should be necessary at all. This rapper has been a fabric of the scene for the best part of 20 years, be it as a solo artist or part of the many agenda-setting crews he's been part of, such as the Uncontrollables, SASASAS, and his most recent collective, Roadblock, with Killer Keller and Prime Cuts. Whatever he's doing, whether it's solo or part of a crew, Harry has always led from the front with a professionalism, attitude and mind-blowing skill that has set world records. A true card-carrier musical nerd and lifelong student of the culture, Harry's enthusiasm, vision and vibes are utterly inspiring. And when it comes to hip-hop from a D&B perspective, you really couldn't find a more appropriate person to chat to. So join us for the next hour and 20 minutes. Get yourself comfortable. Make yourself a cup of tea as we are about to go deep into Harry's upbringing, his love for collaborating, his inspirations, his influences, and a whole slew of insights into his awesome and inspiring career. This is why he is one of the most influential, versatile and respected rappers in UK MC culture. Genuinely, I cannot say enough superlatives about this man. This is an awesome conversation. They always are. Huge shouts to everybody who supports the One More Thing platform. If you like what we're doing on this podcast, then you can visit our website one-more-thing.co.uk or you can even support us on Patreon. You know where to find us. Now let the conversation begin. One more thing. One more thing. One more thing. Harry Shotter. How the devil are you, man? I'm good, man. I'm good. I'm good. I'm active. It's been a crazy summer so far, as it yeah. always is, man. Festival season and all that. But there's been some good highlights this year. There's been some amazing moments. You know, drum is in such a, a crazy space right now in terms of the popularity and in terms of the numbers that come in, in terms of the reach and 
you know, what people yeah. are doing. It's, 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 it's a mad time. So to be part of it and to see the growth from when I first came in to say this summer is pretty mad, man. Do you know what I mean? Wow. Wow. Because, I mean, you've been seeing it grow and been playing to some of the massive audiences. As part of SASAS, you've been at the front and seen this coming for quite some time. But would you say this summer has been particularly different? Because it does really feel like all eyes are on drum and bass at the moment. Really, yeah, I think it? all eyes are definitely on drum and bass. I mean, it was like when I first came into drum and bass, it wasn't really it wasn't uh, at festivals. You know, Andy C maybe would be there maybe the odd person, high contrast, certain people you might see at festivals, but it wasn't 10 names. It wasn't, you know, drum and bass shelling it down into 10,000 people. And it wasn't, you know, yeah. worried about Henry are doing and these events at Wire in the City and all these other things that have gone on. And it was just, you know, you had West Fest and things like that. That was, that was a big highlight, which it still is. But now there's just so much going on and, it, and the reach is crazy, man. You know what I'm saying? What what people are doing now with the, with the marketing, with their own online marketing, with the way they're just like, they take it super serious now and they're really like reaching a big audience. And, and it's, what I like about it is, you know, these guys, they, they're just still doing their thing. If you look at Boo and Headex as two examples, mm. they did exactly what they what they did when they came into the game. Yep. They're just now delivering it to a huge audience and, and just bringing more people into the scene. Yeah. You know I'm so yeah, to me personally, I think it's beautiful what's going on with the scene right now, man. From, from when I stepped in the scene, from doing tiny small clubs, 300 capacity to now these huge events and everyone is all about drum and bass and it's, it's just amazing, man. Yeah, you're absolutely right on, on loads of different levels. When drum and bass was at festivals before, it would be, you know, like the side by the tent or the accelerated culture tent would be like right in the arse end of the festival by the toilets with the worst rig in there and loads <laughs> of securities. We, it would be like an almost like an afterthought, like we were hidden in the corner or something like that, really. Yeah. But now it's it's part of the main stage. It's part of the lineups and stuff like yeah. that now, really, yeah. isn't it? And you're right yeah. about Boo and Headex and, you know, anybody who's got to the top in that way, they, they're not compromised in any type of way. They brought their music to the new generation and then the new generation have kind of taken it on in this type of way, haven't they? It's amazing. Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely good times, man. And you go somewhere like Boomtown, it's like, you know, there's stage after stage after stage of so much talent and the way it's presented and the professionalism now as well. Do you know what I'm saying? No one's messing about now. I mean, I was, I was lucky enough to do one of the closing sets of Boomtown myself with like, Hazard hype and Dillinger. Can you imagine that, man? Do you know what I mean? It was set with that. It's incredible, man. Like wow. Dillinger to me is like one of my all-time favorite producers in drum and bass. He's one of the people that really got me more into looking at the production and the, and the music. Not that I make music, but I was just fascinated by how he made those sounds. Like you know, the, the fucked out bitch record. There was like um, Twist Them Out. Obviously, he did with Skibs his vocal version. It ain't mm. loud. All that stuff he did with Lemon D. Incredible. So to end up doing a, a set of him at Boomtown alongside an absolute legend like Hype, who's a trailblazer in this scene, who paved the way for you know so many great artists to come through, and Hazard, who is just like just the king. The man, like, you know, the king of this shit. Like, <laughs> it has it again on Saturday and Kerry, and I was just like, I just look at that guy in amazement because he's so humble and so chilled. But what he does and what he does yeah. production is, is unparalleled, man. So to do a set with those three at such a big festival like Boomtown and shut it down and have the closing set, man, I just give thanks every time. Just grateful, man. Wow, that's amazing. I want to hear more about that, and I want to chat more about drum and bass. But first, I, I actually want to talk about hip hop. Yeah. Um, you know that th this month in particular has been 50 years of hip hop. And they've been celebrating the anniversary out in New York, and um, yeah, I've been doing quite a few interviews with MCs and just joining the dots and exploring the parallels between drum and bass and hip hop culture. And mm. I think you know certainly for yourself and this summer in particular, there's no better example than yourself, really. I mean, literally a couple of weeks ago from us recording this, you were supporting Jizza from the Wu Tang, yeah. like you know, yeah. that's and that's just one of millions of hip hop links with you i mean you are hip-hop to the very very core aren't you it's in your dna yeah, i mean yeah if you want to take it back right to the beginning that that's what got me into music do you know what i'm saying when i first heard someone rap i was just blown away by that and i was like wow i need to do this i started rapping along to tunes i immediately sold all my toys to buy any hip-hop records i could get my hand on hands on wow. so it was amazing that, that my nan actually lived in a road which is this is just life it's so crazy sometimes my nan lived in a road where they used to get import albums from america so I had access to all the early hip hop records coming from the States that before you would have to go up to London and go to places like Groove Records and um, probably Black Market as well. And these places, all these early kind of record shops, Mr. Bongo's places like that. Mm. And um, Because my nan lived in Essex and this shop was the end of the road. And we just visit my nan. Every time I visit my nan, she give me five pound, go and buy a hip hop album. And that's how it worked. Do you know what I mean, every wow. time, I, you, know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So that was how I got my little vinyl collection going from early with hip hop. And 
from that day, I was just a student of it, man. I just always just was like buying all the albums. I started looking at all the magazines. Hip Hop Connection was a publication that was out in the UK, which I get every month and read all the interviews. And it's it's mad thinking back because now we get our information like this quick. If something happens straight away, it's on this phone and we know mm. what's going on. And it, it, it travels so fast now. You know what I'm saying? But back then you had to wait for a magazine to come out every month to get that information or listen to those interviews with your favorite artists and stuff. So, so those were crazy times, man. There wasn't so many radio shows back then. You really had to search it out. So I remember being in my bed, man, like sort of like 10, 11 years old, like trying to stay up till 2 a.m. to listen to all these hip hop shows, man. And sometimes mm-hmm. even the signal, you couldn't really get it because, you know, we got um, 279, Choice FM. I was out of London, so the signal was pretty bad coming from a South London radio station, but I could gradually hear all the little tunes and that and, you know, it was just, I was just, I was so like addicted to it. And the thing is, right, I still am. I still am a massive hip hop head, man. Like, I still listen to all the albums. I still like, you know, I'm, I'm, I look at all the blogs. I'm like, I see what's going on with all that, with the crews and the MCs. And I'm still a huge fan of it, man. So, like, and I think if you retain that passion for it, that carries into your music, your live performance and everything else, man. And I, I'd say, even though I'm, I'm, you know, primarily seen as a drum and bass MC, the influence from hip hop is what kind of makes me unique in the scene. I would say, yeah, yeah, definitely. And there was there was a quote that you said in one interview. I'm, no, it was in your book actually, the the twelve months book, where you say like hip hop gave you the voice, but drum and bass gave you the audience in that type of way, really. And um, yeah, I mean, I love the stories because there's there's an amazing podcast with you out already with Killer Keller, which is only a couple of months old, really. But you know, you were, I think, you know, what, was, what was the story that you were selling bars? You were doing bars for people for twenty p and yeah. stuff like that. You were basically performing for people, and this is going back to like the age of six or seven, isn't it? Yeah, like, this exactly. is super right. young. Exactly. That was that, and that's that just naturally happened because I was rapping along to records, like whatever it was. There was a lot of uh, who do I like? Like I like Fresh Prince's music because it was kind of like it was more fun, and he'd tell stories and stuff like that. So I used mm. to like emulate the the bars off his records. It was at times it was him and Jazzy Jeff. So it was Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. So I'd emulate the bars, the storytelling bars, and like it just got round the school. Ah, oh, this kid can rap, man. Like blah blah blah. And I was everyone keeps asking me for these lyrics, man. Like first I was just doing it for nothing. I thought, oh, give me twenty p and I'll do one in it. Like hustle for that. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, that, that's just how it went, man. Do you know what I mean? Like hustling for music. And that's that's where the whole Harry Shotter name even came from. Shotting lyrics. It's not. It's not shotting anything else. It's shotting lyrics. It's shotting bars. You know what I'm saying? So it comes from the childhood. It comes from that background of kind of shotting lyrics in the playground to now shotting lyrics on a live stage to a live audience. You know what I mean? Amazing, amazing. And selling your toys as well to buy hip hop albums. Can you remember any particular kind of big, you know, like it's, it's a big thing to do as a kid when you love your toys and you think, well, okay, you know, I, I, I'm growing up now. This isn't part of my life. Can you remember any particular toys that you've sold or anything? Yeah, I definitely remember because the thing was like, you know, I was quite young to be selling them, to be honest. I was like six, probably about seven, to be honest, because I first heard the music around six and became a hip hop junkie, probably seven. Do you know what I mean? And really, when I see Run DMC, my mum took me to see Run DMC in 86, Raising Hell Tour. Do you know what I mean? I think I was, I think I was five or six then. And that's, that's I was, when I saw Run DMC, LL Cool J, Houdini and the Beastie Boys, I was like, wow. I want to do this. Man. Your like, mum took you to that gig. Yeah, because I was I was just like I, I wasn't really I've got to be honest, man. At that point, you know, I'm I'm into I'm into a lot of sport now, football I love and everything else. But back then it was music. Everything was just tough vision. Music, music, music. So from when they came to the UK, my mum was like, Yeah, she got me a ticket. She took me, obviously. I was too young to go up myself. She took me and I was just like, wow. And that that, that I think that moment, seeing all those guys perform live made me think like, nah, I just need to learn more about this. I need to have all that out. Everything that comes out from this scene, this culture, I need it in my house. This is what I'm, so, you know, I will sell my toys and I used to love Star Wars. So like I, so I had the Ewok Village, for instance. You've ever seen this big Ewok Village yeah. thing? Sick, man. I wish I still had it now, but. <laughs> I, I had friends. I was jealous of friends who had that, man. The Ewok what? Village was serious. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, the Ewok Village. I remember selling that. Uh, I sold, I can't believe I sold all my Star Wars figures. I used to see all these like kind of like it weren't Marvel, but it was something else. I can't think what it was, but it was it was something like a Marvel kind of thing. Sold all them, and it was just yeah, it was just anything I could sell, just get get the next records because there was always these new ones coming in. Especially where I had had access to the record shop, it was like wow, now oh, what's this Karis one? Who's this? Do you yeah. know what I mean, kind of minded album came out. I was like, this looks amazing, and I'm hearing the bridges over and South Bronx and all these records, and I'm like, wow, I just, you know, I need to sell more toys, man. So they had to go. <laughs> they wow, had to go. wow. Yeah. 
Now, this was set to the backdrop of what was building up to be a pretty rough time for you as well, wasn't it? Because in, I mean, I, I just, it's the one thing that I took from your book, because I read that around about the time when I was writing Steve Fantasy's book, and okay, I was yeah. just devouring everybody's book, really, I could, as, as, as prep, really, to write my first book or co-write it with Steve. Mm. Um, and the one thing that I took, you know, like this, this period in your life, then you're getting into hip hop, you're selling your toys, you're turning into a hip hop head, but then mm. your life went into disarray for a couple of years didn't it and i yeah. imagine that hip-hop was a savior for you in another way really and, yeah. and a, a whole world of escapism really as um, yeah. your family kind of broke apart didn't it for a while yeah man i mean like i was i think i was six years old my mum and dad uh, split up and my dad this got, is all around the same time like yeah all around the same time and it's all it's all kind of like parallel you know what i'm saying and my dad and my mum split up my mum moved out my dad got remarried really quickly like really quickly it was pretty it's pretty crazy man how quick it was suddenly like oh now it's this and um and um he basically took me to Aylesbury with him and i had to i had to just totally like be away from my sisters my sisters were older than me innit? and my sisters are like at the time i think they were like 19 20 so they kind of just moved into a flat was doing their own thing and um, yeah, man, it was like, I was totally thrust into this whole new world of like, you know, this is, a, I think it was about 80 miles away from everyone else. That seems like so a big amount when you're a yeah, kid. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm up and down the motorways all the time. It's nothing. But back then I thought like, I'm in a new world. Um, yeah. I've got I've got a stepbrother. I've got a stepsister. I've got a stepmom who didn't turn out to be the very a very nice person in the end. You know what I'm saying? It, with me, with our own children and also with my dad in the end. You know what I'm saying? But obviously at the time he couldn't see that. And, um, and yeah, it was, it was some really crazy times, man. Like it, I, I was in a quite a sort of chaotic household, I'd say, do you know what I'm saying? Like for instance, yeah. if you take me out of it, uh, my stepbrother, he was older than me. And if he, if he got, if he, I think he was 13, 14. And I think one time he got caught smoking cigarettes and she got his snooker cue and smashed it over his back, man. Like imagine how much, how hard you have to hit someone to break yeah. it over their back. Do you know what I'm saying? So, and it, and it was the yeah. kind of stuff around me and, and the threat of violence and, all these kind of things and really just wanted to be with my mum, but being quite, being at the time, quite, quite a placid kid, really, to be honest. I was quite shy at that age. Do you know what I'm saying? And absolutely, probably, but like broken hearted, completely. Yeah. Like, this is like, you know, you the, the whole planet has changed for you. I, and the one thing, the one consistency there would have been the music then, yeah. really, wouldn't it? Well, it was always the music. And I'd, I'd literally go into that room and it's like, I would be like, I would be like r learning these rap lyrics. Like, like, like people learn timetables. I'd be sitting there, yeah, just like this, so focused into it, just so deep into the music. And it was like, I think you mentioned the word, it's like escapism from mm. what was going on out there and all the turmoil that was going on. Do you know what I'm saying? And, and all the, all, and there was a lot of back and forth between my mom, my father, and the stepmom, and my sisters, all kinds of craziness that sometimes came to a head in the yeah. street. And just, it was just mad. And the one thing, the one thing, the solitude and the thing I always had to go to was the music. You know what I'm saying? And it was at that time, jungle didn't even exist. Drum and bass yeah. wasn't there. It was it was purely a hip hop thing that I was listening to. Do you know what I'm saying? And it was like I wasn't even really writing lyrics then. I was just listening, learning their bars, and just and just getting so much from it, man. I couldn't even explain how much that like, I got from it in those times because it was just like I could literally lock off, you know, like put a speaker, I had a speaker like this, and just like. And just just lose myself in the music, man. It's like you know that Eminem, lose yourself. That's what I used to do. I used to lose myself in the music for hours on end. Wow. And I think that's how I became like a student of it. Not because it was like right, I want to learn how to do this. It was just it was almost organic that I just listened to it so much and I loved it so much that I became the student of it. You know what I'm saying? It's like if you if you if you're if you if it's kung fu and you just do it every day all day and you just love it and you've got a passion for it, you're gonna end up in the field of Kung Fu and and that's what I kind of done with Bari and MC. And it was just, it was just natural that I was going to kind of end up in this space, man. Amazing. Amazing. And this, cause I was going to ask you at one point, like there's so much discipline and this is, this practice, 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 and then practice a whole shit ton more really, isn't it? You know, mm -hmm. and, like I, I watched so many videos of you and it's like how and i know that you get asked this question all of the time or people remark on how quickly you're able to unlock your phone while you're still spitting the bars and stuff like that okay, but yeah, yeah. putting it to memory and having that clarity none of that comes you know it, it comes naturally to you as a skill but only after like you know i would imagine 10 12 hours a day practicing at certain points in your yeah, life really like it, it, it's it the discipline isn't it it is it is like a discipline man it's like 
there's an art to it, man. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like if you're studying an art and you and you and you love it so much that you want to be you love it so much that you want to be good at it. You know, it's not for monetary purposes or anything. It's not, you're not even thinking of career. You're just thinking of like, I want to be the best at this shit, man. Do you know what I mean? And so that's wow. why you spend day after day after day writing, practicing, learning. And um, I used to do things before. I used to link MCs. This is much later on, but we'd get together. We'd throw on a beat and we'd say, right, it's two hours, man, nonstop. We've got, we've got a freestyle, nonstop, eight bars. The last word I say is bus, so you've got to say bus. The last word he says is transcript. I've got to say transcript. And we've got, we got to keep it going. If oh, my gosh. Well, that's like going to the gym. That's like a gym <laughs> session, basically, for two hours. Just it bam, bam, bam. Cool, bam. Yeah, but no, but don't linger on it. Go back in. Keep it moving. Do you know what I'm saying? And and that that's something that even now, in you know, when I'm on stage, I, I freestyle quite a bit now. I enjoy it. The crowd like it. It involves the crowd. It makes it more of it's an experience of all of us together. If you're rapping to the crowd, talking about things that are going on in the audience, and um, and it's something I've learned from them that I've now been able to bring to drum and bass and bring to what I do live. And even if you forget a lyric, because everyone forgets a bar or something at some point, you just got straight freestyle, man. And that that's from them days of what we call like training in almost a dojo. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Wow. <laughs> what MCs would you do that with? Because I know you, I think you went to school with fun, didn't you? Uh, we didn't um, go to school together, but we was we was friends from really early because right, right. Uh, we, we actually linked to hip hop here because he comes from the hip hop side of things as well. Um, I was making music with his cousin and um, he's, he's, he's a rapper, but he was also a producer. So I went to see his, there was an under 18s event at Chats Palace in Hackney. And I went there because it, I was under 18, so I could finally go, because I could never used to go to my favourite shows back in the day, man. I was gutted, but it is what it was. But anyway, I got there, and um, I watched um, his cousin perform in a group called Lords of Rap. That's who I mainly came to see. Some other friends of mine performed called Red Ninja. And then I saw Fun Performers, a group called Eclipse. And I was like, wow, he's sick, man. So I spoke to him after. We we joined the dots. we become friends. And we, we made hip-hop together before we made any drum and bass or any uncontrollable yeah. he was like making hip hop together when I, I think I was probably about 15. I think fun's about three, four years older than me. So we'd have been 18, 19. Do you know what I'm saying? And, and that's, that's where our link came through hip hop as well. Do you know what I'm saying? Really cool. Even with Skibber, to be honest, you know, even mm. though like it was when he started doing the two times freestyle thing that I thought, Oh, maybe we could do a tune together. Cause before I just thought, Oh, he's my idol, man. He's the Don of drum and bass. Do you know what I mean? But when he started jumping on uh, the hip hop beats with debt, and doing two times freestyle I was like, oh, maybe that maybe we could do something together on that tip, man. Double time lyrics, but on hip hop beats. And so hip hop almost brought me to Skibs as well, in a sense. Do you know what I mean? Wow, the mm. power of hip hop. I mean, we're, we're talking about Skibs. We need to pay respect to Skibs. It was the last time I interviewed you was for an article for one more thing where I spoke to loads of his nearest and dearest and got some beautiful stories. But yeah, I mean, that, that you, you go back to like 2000, I think. And I remember the story that I remember is that he was so just open to you and just gave you the space and gave you the confidence and just said, right, let's write together, basically. He opened the door, yeah. we ego free, mm. completely ego free, wasn't it? Oh, mate, that was like that. That period was um, incredible, man. Like, because that was at the time of my life, 2001, probably, yeah, 2001, yeah, when I so was. You were a teenager. Rave, you were biggest raving years, to be honest. I was probably about 20 of them times. You know what I mean? So it's, it's my raving years, man. Like, going out Thursday, Friday, Saturday, pyrotechnics if it's on on the Sunday. Like, that was real raving times. You know what I mean? So, in those times, and even to now, Skibbity is my favorite MC. So I was like, you know, we got to the point where I heard him do the hip hop stuff and I was like, when well, A&R man actually said to me, who would you uh, like to work with as a publishing guy? And I said, straight away, Skibbity. And he goes, actually, no, Skibbity, I could make that happen, man. And he goes, oh, for real? He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I hooked it up, sent the numbers through. And then we linked and we had a good conversation, me, him, Dave and Godfrey. We all sat there and we spoke for hours. And then like literally a couple of days later, we was in the studio making a tune, man. And then it, it literally from that day, right through until you know his untimely passing we never ever stopped making tunes talking on the phone you know creating concepts performing together it never stopped from that day do you know what i'm saying so yeah he opened the door um you know at the time definitely like huge artist huge icon to me huge role model and um he he looked out for me over the years definitely man like massively you know what i'm saying if there were certain things he thought i needed to do he'd call me and say this you know I mean, certain bits of advice and um oh, just studio wise as well man he gave me access to his studio do you know what i'm saying he was like anytime you want to come to the studio to do this like you know it was literally like the doors open come in and work as much as you want man do you know what i mean and even times when he knew like 
you know, before I started making money and stuff like that, he knew man didn't have much paper. He'd be like, oh, we all got pizzas and that, man. You like a beer in it? I'll get you a beer, bro. You know what I mean? Like, he was always like oh, that. You know what I'm saying? Oh, even calling on. that man on the way, oh, you hear it, bro? I'll get the kettle on. Like, he's just a big brother like that in that sense. Do you know what I mean? Dearly missed, man. Lush, lush. Yeah, sorely, sorely missed. Do you hear his voice in your head at any points when you're doing stuff? Do you ever yeah. hear him and think, you know, oh, yeah, Skibber would say I, that? Or I, 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 always, I always think like, Right. I mean, I mean, this is something, you know, the music scene sometimes, man, it gets political, isn't it? Like, mm. like right. I've written this tweet out or I've, 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 I've got a situation I've got to deal with. What would Skibs do? Uh, <laughs> what would Skibbity do, man, in this situation? Do you know what I'm saying? And, and most time he's got a very clear head and he's very cool and humble and he chill out and he'd always like approach it in a cool and humble way. So in that sense, it just gives you that sense of like, oh, maybe I'll hold back. Maybe I'll like just call a man first and we'll talk it through before I talk about it publicly or whatever. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like, it's that mm. sense of like that bigger brother, that that good influence on your shoulder. Do you know what I'm saying? That um, He definitely yeah. to my career and to the table for a lot of artists as well. I think with Skibs. I think a oh, lot definitely. of advice from him. Obviously I was lucky enough to be close with him and rolling with him nonstop since 2000 and 2001. But you know, I know, I know that he he would phone up artists if he thought they would if he thought they were doing something good, he'd ring them and say, "Yo, you're killing it, stay on that track." Or if he thought, "Oh, you shouldn't be doing that," he'd ring them and say, "Yo, just l- let me bro- let me know something, bro. Like, you shouldn't really be doing this because it might hinder your career and you might want to delete that post." Or all these things. He's like in that yeah. sense, big brother man, a great influence. Do you know what I mean? Go on, beautiful, beautiful. Was he one of the MCs that you were kind of in the dojo with when you'd have a, a freestyling session? Did you ever do? I mean, I know that you would freestyle with him on the stage and stuff like that, and roll yeah. with him. But was you know, would he was he someone you would train with in that type of way, like lyrically? I think it wasn't really that sort of dojo freestyle thing. What me and Skids did together, and what we grew with together, we learned how to make songs together. Do you know what I'm saying? Because I was coming from a hip hop background. He was coming from a sort of a rave MC background. Mm. So I was, I at the time, I probably was like, I'd made more songs than him. Do you know what I'm saying? So I was sort of bringing those expertise to the table of structure and what works at radio and things like that. And he was bringing all the pizzazz of stage and, you know, uh, persona and, you know, like how to, how to project your voice and all these kind of things. And it's not just about the bars, it's about how you say them and the swagger. And he, and, and when we came together, we just learned off each other. So I've, it wasn't really a thing if we was building, the freestyle skills we was learning how to make proper music together proper songs like we'd make a tune and we'd be like well both of us we, neither of us can make that chorus the best who can make that chorus the best oh at the time we rolled with style of g let's get style of g in to do the hook things like that do you know what i'm saying and um we kind of built like that and i learned a lot about from him as well with sort of stagecraft man because he was just the master of having that presence on the stage and he didn't even have to reach to do it he didn't have to you know some people you can tell they're trying too much sometimes <laughs> like yeah. it's cool i get it man you're enthusiastic you want to interact with the crowd but skibber never overdid it he just knew exactly how to do it to the right extent to make his oh, connection man. with the crowd and all these little so things like that over the years man but so much off stage stuff as well so much kind of stuff just you know like skibber like i say very humble very much a gentleman do you know what i'm saying it's like that's what I kind of try to be in the industry as well. Just, just call with people, man. The ego thing, I'm not really in it. Do you know what I'm saying? Like at the end of the day, after, after we get off the mic or after we get off the decks or after we made this, even if it's a top 20 hit, we're still all humans. Do you know what I'm saying? And that's what he taught me as well, which I think yeah. should up some other head sometimes should <laughs> definitely get up on man, because definitely. My in the industry and just to, and just to deal with people nicely will get you a long way, man. Yeah, yeah, hugely, hugely. And I think, you know, as we're going back to the start of the conversation, as drum and bass gets bigger, those egos also get bigger for certain people. I get it. It's easy to to fall into the trap when everyone's telling you all the time, oh, you're the greatest, you're this, you're that. And, and yeah, take the compliments because you've probably had a hard path to get to where you want to get. And it's, yeah, when they say about flowers and all that, you know what I'm saying? People deserve their flowers while they're still here. And mm. I get that. I love that. But also just, just re- you know, you need good people around. You need. I think people sometimes need people around them that they've known for years that can say, shut up, man, you're an idiot. Like, just, just be normal as well and not and not put you into that godly status where no one can, like, tell you anything. Because yeah. that's when people lose it. I've seen it with musicians over the years in any scene or even boxers. Do you know what I mean? When, every, when you're pure yes men around you, you know, you kind of lose who you are sometimes massively yeah, yeah. i never want to lose that essence and it's easy like i said it, we've all got ego do you know what i'm saying it's sometimes it's sometimes it's a driving force in all of you but you know it's something we have to kind of check sometimes and try and kill off gradually do you know what i mean 
Hugely, hugely. And I guess, you know, the people that you roll with and, you know, like the influence of Skibidi, um, but also Steve Fantasy as well, you know, somebody you've known for yeah. an incredible amount of time. And I could picture him when he was saying, you know, about a friend calling you up and saying, no, 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 come on, I'm putting you back in your place. I, I've yeah. heard Steve. Steve's done that to me personally as well. You know, having yeah. people like that around, that's almost like the defining characteristic of SASAS really, isn't it? The realness, yeah. the way that you're just basically all buddies you know and you've oh, been well, through probably one of the hardest times i think i've ever known a, a modern a contemporary collective to go through you've lost so many people like mm. but you've stuck together and you know steve's always still smiling and joking but he'll he'll say it how it is you say it how it is skibber always did storming always did yeah. uh, dan you know shabbat always does as well and i think that's the defining characteristic which has kind of brought you together in that way, that that realness that you're not fluffing up each other's egos in any way whatsoever. Like. Yeah, no, exactly. And the whole SASS thing, it, again, was quite an organic thing. It was literally originally just put together to be the last um, ever set at a club called Area in London. That's so it, yeah. Skibber and Fantasy put on the party. They wanted to do a special set. So they thought, okay, let's do SASS. So at the time, obviously, Skibber and myself were known to roll together. Storming, Shabba, everyone knows they you know, they came up together as well. So it just made sense to do S A S A S E S. You know, fantasy brings through Mackie G. We do this set, it goes off. We think that's the end of it. Do you know what I'm saying? We think that's it. And then uh Westfest end up booking it. Shout out to Grant, you know, he saw the sort of vision from early and um we did it there, and that's when it just went mad. It went crazy because it was in front of a big audience. And and I think we grew, man. We grew like we was we was all like me and Skibber were really good friends. Me and Fantasy were friends. Fantasy and Skibber were friends, but we we all gelled differently in that group, man. Do you know what I'm saying? If one person was down, like we did big tours and stuff together, we would be away a long time and things like that. If one man was down, everyone else holds that guy up. Do you know what I mean? It was it was definitely beyond music after mm. a certain point. It was real, real friendships, man. Do you know what I'm saying? And and even to this day, man, you know, saying very like terrible losing storms and then skibs as well. It's just like you wouldn't even. It's unfathomable to think when we first started that would even happen. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? But it, it it did happen, and and still to this day, like whenever you know the remaining members, myself, Shabba, and Fantasy get together, it's just so much love there and so much love for the people that have gone that still gel us together. Do you know what I'm saying? And 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 one thing we've always wanted to do is is continue the name because you know that's what Stormin and Skibbity both told us they wanted us to do. They want they they they, they Stormin particularly. I remember saying, "Don't let no one forget me, man." Always because he knew yeah. what was happening. He's like, "Don't let no one forget me." Always say my name. Always keep the SSAS out there. And yeah. and you know we're just we're just holding up their wishes, man. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. What a legacy. What a legacy there. And I mean, you guys were right at the forefront, as we're saying at the start, you know, those massive crowds, those huge like 20,000 crowds all around the world in places that you didn't even know existed and stuff like yeah. that. You yeah. know, this, you know, you, you were there alongside, you know, kind of chasing status and Andy C. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was you guys as well, like headliners kind of it, it set in the scene and the foundations five, six years ago ahead of where we are now with drum and yeah. bass really, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. it? Must have been wild. Like, I, like you said, no Nobody expected it to blow up in the way that it ever did. No, it didn't. It, and it was crazy. And we, we almost like, it got to the point where we was doing some shows and we would literally be, say us and Andy or say us and Chase and Status, you know, it would just be us on the lineup. And then, you know, there'd be like people like Tiesto there and like, you know, like these massive house producers and DJs and Steve Aoki and people like that. And they'd all be backstage just chilling. And, you know, Mackie's a big house fan. So he'd be telling me who they all are. I don't know as much on, on that scene yeah. as him. Oh, brother, we're in the room with these, like, these men are massive. And I'm like, wow, really? Yeah. <laughs> it it, it would sort of be, just be crazy, man. And we, we, we just enjoy every minute. And then there'd be certain times when we'd like, we did Creamfields for the first time and they was playing like just baseline house before, before our set. And I was like, how are they going to take to us, man? And like, I said to Fantasy, I go, do you think they're going to get into it? It went off. Everywhere we went, it went off, man. I, cu I couldn't think of a, uh, you know, actually, there was one time in Belgium. <laughs> I'll share a funny one with you. There was one time in Belgium when uh, they just weren't down for the MCs at all. And they really? were in full squad. It's full squad. Skibber, me, Shava, Storming. And um, Skibber's like, we, Skibber's things like, let me just do the, the, the baitest lyrics that everyone knows. Do you really want to go home? No noise at all. So we were just like, we're just going to have to pass the mic and host, man, and dance around for the next hour. And oh, they just wow. were there for the music. That's the only time it happened. But other places where you thought, oh, maybe they're not going to be down for this or everything, it went off every time. Do you know what I'm saying? And uh, we just thought we were doing something important for the MCs at the time, man. Do you know what I'm saying? Because sometimes the MCs get kind of pushed to the side or... Oh, yeah, like, massively. important or respect what they, you know, the lineage in the culture. And we just thought, right, we're actually now in the forefront now, so... It's mad. Like now you see like 
you know, look at Headex and X, and now, now he's on Radiant Main. So I love that. Or when I see Boo with Evil, I'm like, yes, like, and now there's more of us doing it now. It's amazing. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, now is a great time for MCs, and we'll get onto that in a moment. And just vocal culture and respecting and acknowledging and crediting the vocalist, really, whether mm -hmm. whether that's a singer or a rapper. But Europe is like the, the, the relationship between Europe and MCs has always been really strange. And I guess it's because of the language barriers for a start, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it, it's definitely changed now. MCs are being warmed to a lot more. But for a long time, even at, you know, the biggest drum and bass festival in the world, like, like, um, there was a couple of years where you barely see, like maybe only one or two of the headliners could bring an MC with them because yes. that's stipulated in their booking and their rider and they don't want to perform without one. Um, mm -hmm. But that's changed a lot really, hasn't it? I mean, what's what's your relationship been like with Europe? Because Belgium's played a role, a huge role in yeah. Jump Up and played a role in SASASAS yeah, as well, yeah. really, didn't it? You yeah. know, with the way that Fantasy and Mackie linked up and stuff. It used to be like uh, you'd have crews going over every single week to Belgium on the Euro stuff because of the, the culture out there exactly man and they created a massive scene out there and um it was like i remember the first time we did rampage man shout out to murdoch man i love that guy man yeah, yeah. he brought us out there but when we was announced at that point there was a real sort of prejudice and hatred towards the mc in drum and bass they didn't mm. get it, whether it was a language bar or anything else and there was i remember there being a bit of a backlash on their facebook man like a serious backlash. like why are you booking these guys we don't want them and everything else so we kind of like we linked up and we had a chat and we was like look we're going to do this gig but we're going to do it smartly yeah we're going to go there and we're not going to MC as much in terms of the bars do you know what i'm saying we're going to go there with the energy we're going to turn up we're going to smile we're going to smash it but we're really going to deal with stage presence and interaction with the crowd yeah, we're not, we're professionals at the end of the day. We're not going to go there and do a thousand bars when that is not what they want at this current stage. So we went over there, we handled the set really professionally and we literally, we got them on side, man. But, but, you know, literally by three tunes in, they're raving with us, they're screaming, they're making noise. And, 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 and yeah, and we converted them, man, because we had a conversation about it. We were, you know, I think the thing about us is we respect the audience as well. You know, some people were like, I just do what I do, man. I don't care. I'm like, nah, we're not gonna we're not gonna go there and do that. Do you know what I'm saying? We're gonna go there and respect what this audience wants because at the end of the day, we're delivering entertainment to them. They pay their ticket money. So yeah. we have to deliver a show that they're going to enjoy and we're gonna enjoy it as well. You know what I mean? We we don't have to we don't have to spit a thousand bars. It just so happens that a lot of the time that's what people want from us. So we give them what <laughs> they want. But in this case, it's not what they want. So we went there, we did that, and 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 they really I remember all the comments after, they loved it, got a great vibe. We were brought out there the next year. Do you know what I'm saying? And that year we was able to be a little bit more barry sort of a bit more 50 50 on the set and they loved it do you know what i'm saying and it was and it was it was great because we kind of converted them into our style and then we could kind of like go you know a bit of a compromise on both sides but still be ourselves and and that's what we've always done man we've always respected the audience we've always tried to deliver a good performance no matter where it is you know if it, if it is a festival that's more you know say we're like the only mcs there and it's very much hybrid minds or vocal dmb or more liquid that's the set we're going to deliver. We we analyze the, the, the festival and the audience before we go there and we give them what they want. And that's kind of the thing we do with Europe. Do you know what I'm saying? We understand Europe can be different and we when we can't we can't try to tailor make our show to be the best show we can for that particular crowd, man. Oh, I love that. That's like proper that you're being ambassadors for MC culture there, really. And I guess that's the flip on things because um you know, exploring the parallels between hip hop and drum and bass, there's loads in the culture. The biggest difference is as an MC, you are coming into a set. You don't know what, especially if you've just been booked and you don't even know who you're rolling with. You're just yeah. on a lineup and then you're put 100%. with a DJ. You don't know what tunes they're playing. You've got to keep your ear out for the mixes. They might be playing dub, so you don't know when the vocals are going to come yeah. in. There's so many other factors. But then thinking about it from the crowd side, if the crowd aren't into MCs, they're also on their toes. So you also have to think about what their level of appreciation or engagement is with MCs in a country where MC culture isn't as rife as it is in the UK, where, you know, DJs and MCs come hand in hand in the UK. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, in, you know, maybe, I don't know, like Estonia or somewhere like that, where there hasn't been so much of the culture, you've got to think of it like that as well. So not only are you thinking, you know, if you're coming over as an MC on your own and you're playing with a DJ who you might not even know or have that much of a rapport with, you also have to think about the crowd and what they think of the MC as well, really, don't yeah. you? I've not really kind of thought of it in that way. Yeah, man, because what we want to do, we want to convert as many people as possible 
into liking what we do. We don't want to piss people off. We don't want to go there and be the ego take over. We're going to be like, well, this is what I do. I don't care. Like it or lump it. You know, the, like I said, these are audience members that are coming to watch a show. We want to give you the best show we can. We want to give you this. We can, we, we're analysing what you like, what you don't like and everything else. And we're going to give you the best show we can, man. Do you know what I'm saying? And with MCs, like, obviously... MCs haven't been perfect over the years either. Do you know what I'm saying? They're right. There have been some MCs that, you know, have come along and spat on vocals and things like that and not let tunes ride and, and not understood the music. I, I love the music. So if Mampy Swift is doing some crazy triple deck mix, why would I spit on that? I'm going to hold back, let the mix roll, enjoy it. And I know in two or three tunes, he's going to give me something I would spray on. And then the lyrics going to get more of an impact because they haven't heard lyrics for the last, say, three minutes. So when it does come in, it's going to get more of a crowd reaction. Ooh, you know what yeah. I mean? And, and, working, and, that, and, and the whole thing to me is like, it's not like sometimes they pit the DJ against the MC and all that. It's not that. It's, it's about us working in unity to create the best show. Yeah. And yet sometimes, we'll be, and sometimes it will be letting the mixes ride, more hosting. Let tunes go. Loads of vocals. Wicked. We can do that. Hype up the crowd. Scream. You know what I mean? Sometimes it will be more the DJs playing for you to go hard in and you will go hard. That's what the audience wants. And you just have to really be not just a study of the MC in culture, but the music as well. How does this DJ play? You know, yeah. I'm on stage with uh, Mampy Swift tonight, for instance. I said him before, like he, he obviously DJs. He's a very technical DJ. You've got to work out a way that you, you will still shine, but you'll make Mampy shine and you'll both shine together. And that yeah. way, he'll want to work with you again. The crab will want to see you again. And people will walk away saying, oh, MCs ain't all bad. Even the ones who do sometimes, <laughs> don't like, you know, have this preconceived thing. They don't like MCs. Whereas if they see a professional MC and not someone who's spitting over vocals, not someone who's spitting over the drops and not someone who's MCing maybe too much, you know what I mean? They walk away thinking, no, nah, if it's done right, I'm with it. You know what I mean? And that's, that's, that's the whole aim, really. Definitely, definitely. And I think like I've spoken when I've written about MC culture for magazines before. I remember something that DRS told me and he said that one of the fundamental problems was that um, uh, certainly at the time, this was a couple of years ago, but the MCs wouldn't have there wouldn't be the same amount of budget put aside for them on the lineup. So they would normally go for the local guy who hasn't really had that much practice. He hasn't learned the craft quite so much. So he will fall into those mistakes or she will. Um, and, you know, they might not even they might not realize that they're trying to do their best but they just haven't done their ten thousand hours yet yeah. and it's those that's people who've experienced those mcs that mc represents mc culture for everybody then so suddenly that person has gone away saying that they don't like mcs because they're they've not been invested in as much as the djs have been invested in on the lineup and stuff 100 percent, man that's such a great point that drs made and i've made this to people every now and again i'll talk to people about this online and stuff you get drawn in and when people just say mcs are terrible mcs are trash and i'm saying and, and i'll list out you know, say 10 names, very varied names. I say SP, maybe Dynamite, uh, Skibbity, Shabba, GQ, Raga Twins, um, mm. Foxy, you know, there's there's more, you know what I mean? But I could list out all these different names and they're, and they're very versatile and they're very different in the styles and the way they approach the mic. You can't tell me that these MCs are not talented, but MCs are shit when these are the MCs I'm telling you are available to book in drum and bass. Now, you may have seen, like you said, they spent a lot of money on the DJ coming into the club and they have got no budget. So that the local guy on the local guy really shouldn't be with that DJ because at that point he hasn't got the expertise to work with that DJ. But he might have potential, this young guy, which is why he needs to do his graft room one or, or the first set of the night for a bit, learn these things, and it not just be thrust into working with those kind of guys. So yeah, the yeah, RS makes it. The... Definitely. We'd be mad not to touch on um, Mike Masters because that's yeah. exactly what you're doing with Mike Masters, really, isn't it? You're giving, yeah. you're creating these opportunities for, you know, budding, aspiring um, young talents to come and to have a safe space where they can earn their chops and then, yeah. you know, kind of hone their skills and sharpen their things in a club environment with sick DJs and stuff. And this is a, you know, a really new project for you, isn't it? It is, man. And Mike Masters is something that, um, Shabba and Skibber were actually talking about it. It wasn't called Mike Masters when they were talking about it, but they were talking about it before Skibs passed, and it was sort of a sort of a concept they were they were sort of roughly talking about. And it was obviously when Skibs passed, Shab said, "Shots, do you want to come in on it?" And we spoke deeply about it, and it was something I believe passionately about. So I came in, Fancy came in to help as well. And um, it's it's two things really. It's what you said. It's definitely like somewhere for the younger ones who we see potential in to go and hone their skills in front of a live audience and for almost us to watch them as well and think, ah, oh, they're ready for room one. Next time we put them in route, they're ready. Or, oh, come here, man. Next time, like, maybe don't do this or do that. Or, you know what I'm saying? Like, we can, mm. we can be the uncles for them, you know what I mean, to help them through watching what they do. So there is that. It's for them. But it's also 
for MCs as well who make vocal records and who make songs to be able to go to a place where they can PA their music. Or it's also, even if they haven't got music, it's say like, say for instance, you're more of a rapper MC, like like a DRS, for instance, yeah, more rap kind of approach rather than double time and that mm. kind of vibe. And you keep getting on set to jump up DJs and you're not really being heard in the way you want to be heard. You know, you've got all these lyrics, but people aren't hearing them. It's like is it the music, the frequencies of the music isn't quite right. It gives you the opportunity with Mic Master just to phone up a DJ that plays exactly the way you, you know, the, the, your lyrics are going to shine on and go and do the setting the way you want to do it. Do you know what I'm saying? So it's yeah, like, it's yeah, like, yeah. it's kind of putting the power in the hands of the MCs to run that particular half hour how they want to run it, as opposed to, like you said, turning up and like, oh, who am I with tonight? Oh, I'm with whoever. Do you know what I mean? I've got to now switch my style a little bit and work with this DJ to make it work, which is fine. But it's just something else. It's just another avenue. It's just another, it's, it's another lane for the MCs to be able to shine in a different way. And like you said, also just let these youngers hone their skills, man. Cause there's, I see some really talented young MCs out there and sometimes like they're just rough around the edges a little bit. They just need a bit more time, man. Do you know what I mean? To sort of learn little tricks of the trade. I had to do it, man. When I came in, yeah. I remember big up X, man. I remember I was at somewhere one time and it was my, probably my first year MC into drum and bass and there's no mic monitors, no mic monitors. So I'm 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 shouting because I can't hear myself. So naturally, what you can't hear yourself, you start shouting. Mm. X comes up to me, goes, "Bro, you shout, you're gonna you're gonna kill your voice, man." Like honestly, just like don't shout. It's okay in the crowd. You can't hear yourself out here. Even just put your you know like this so you can hear yourself. Like you see, get doing a lot and things like that. You know what I mean? And uh, and you'll be fine, man. And that was like wicked because wow. he's been in the game for years. Yeah, he was cool enough to come over and say, "Don't shout," because um, you've probably got two other bookings this weekend. Don't lose your voice because then you can't do them bookings. You know what I mean? And that's what you need sometimes. You need someone who's experienced to come and say, yo, do it this way or do it that way. You know what I mean? I do it in the studio a lot with people because I'm I'm quite experienced in the studio. That's like my arena. So if mm. I hear something in the studio, I can have a quick word and say, ah, oh, don't spit the bar like you're in a rave. Just calm down because it's a song and, and you hear the difference on the next take. Do you know what I mean? So we need just more people, just guidance and that for the MCs, man, because there's, there's the raw talent is there. I see it all the time. The raw talent is 100% there, man. Yeah, yeah. It's almost that duty. And I say this a lot in interviews, like, you know, kind of as older people or the next, you know, the previous generation and maybe not, you know, like you and I are kind of middle school, I think, really. Mm. We're similar age from what you said and what I know about you. Um, but, you know, we're kind of we're not the pioneer age. We're in around right at the start of the 90s, but been around long enough. It's our duty now as people who've been in the industry for this long to pass on that information or otherwise the culture doesn't carry on, you know, and you don't yeah. want to stop in on your watch, really. It's, it's a responsibility to help the next generation through now i think it is a hundred percent and i've even put it in a lyric um um, when it comes to this dmb i'm like a middle child and that's facts i feel like the middle child because i've I've, I've watched you know i've I've, I've listened to tapes in school of navigator moose fiver ragga twins and then i've been lucky enough to be around skibar shabba and all this and now i've sort of you know i've seen people like azar and grimer and dreps come through and Mm -hmm. who are younger to be and now there's wiser and people like tiny k and it's like we do have the responsibility knowing sort of the roots of where it came from and watching these guys and everything they brought to the game, having our own time, our own little lane in as well, like being that middle kind of thing, but also having more of a like, I don't know, like the youngers come to me a lot in it. Cause I'm like a little bit more reachable maybe than the guys who are up there, the legends and stuff. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. They come to me for advice and stuff a lot of the time. So it is our role to kind of, you know, give that advice and give them the best advice and, and try and push them forward because we need the next lot coming through, man. We always need that. Like, you know, it can't be me forever. It can't, you know, it can't be yeah, Skiba Shabba forever. Do you know what I mean? We need your wisers and all these new people coming through with the talent and, and that will carry it through to the next generation because that's the thing. The youngers want to see people of their own age as well. They respect the olders, obviously. They respect yeah. the elders and the legends, but they naturally want to see people who are their age as well representing this music. Otherwise, otherwise the music just dies out. It becomes like an old man's music, isn't it? Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. We want this music to keep going throughout the generations. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that's we what want it to be them. remain fresh. You yeah, know, this yeah. Summer, you see it. They're there. The kids are out, man, in force, which is amazing. Oh, it's amazing. Absolutely amazing. I was watching this beautiful video with yourself and Shabs, um, Inner, Endo and Wiser um, oh, yeah, yeah. With, with Fantasy DJing. And I was only going to drip into it for 10 minutes. You know, it was one of those videos. I was watching it for the, the whole hour. Show. Yeah, yeah. yeah Literally, I'm, I'm covering, I'm covered in goosebumps now. Just said, like the absolute skills. And I think that's what, you know, the, the thing that's special about our music and our culture is that it has that energy and it's always forward facing. And yeah, we reach back to the past, but we're always looking into the future. 
And the biggest, most important thing to look into the future is the new generation, really, you know, and yeah. without that new blood, then it gets stagnant. And when you look back at periods which haven't been quite as exciting or inspiring as other periods in drum and bass, it's because we're not looking forwards as much. But if I look back at a period in your career, and I can think of a very particular gig, actually, with d and TV, but it's um, the Uncontrollables. Like, just take yeah. me back, like, the energy that you guys had and the way that you bounced off each other. You work well in groups, I think. You know, it's safe to say that you you are you you work well in collaborations and in yeah. and in groups, don't you? I think you bounce off people incredibly oh, well. Man, but very, the unks, man. When oh. it's the right people, I'm very happy in groups and collaborations. You know what I'm saying? It's like just getting that when you get in the room and everyone's on that same vibe and you're like, you know, the beats are rolling and you're writing off the back of each other, man. I, I thrive off that. I absolutely love that, man. Do you know what I'm saying? That energy you can get off someone else, someone else's idea. Oh, I, w- I wouldn't have said it in that way, man. Do you know what I mean? And with yeah. Unks, he was always like that. He was like, oh, what, what, you've got to bring some food to the table. You know what I mean? If we're writing, what you got? What's your idea? What's your one? And we'd all bounce off each other. And, it, and that was, oh, those days were incredible, man. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, just like take me out of it, Skibber and Fun together as a combo. Like when they did Bar Rage Free, that's some of the best MC in back to back I think I've ever heard in drum and bass. When you you go and look at the the Pyro show they did together, you know, like oh them bars, man. I put, on, I put it on I think on Sunday night, man. I was like, wow, it's like it's just incredible what them two did together. And then and then they brought myself and Dreps in and Rough Stuff was the greatest selector at the time for us. Do you know what I mean? And the best DJ. It was like everything just formed like. And it was powerful, man. And it resonated with people, man. Go on. What's your crowning memory? Well, like, give me some of the your favourite gigs there, really, where things just kind of came together or you just took it up another level. In a similar yeah. way that you did kind of 10 years later with SASASAS. Yeah, it, it was that. Because Unks was making an impact at that time as well that wasn't sort of known as an MC crew, you know what I mean? So, Oh, you were out there on your own. You were in a league of your own completely, really. Yeah, we was we was just everywhere we went. There was like... It was pretty hysterical with the Ravens, man. Like the, the re, like the bars that like fun was coming with at the time. Skips was bouncing off the energy. This is probably about two thousand and eight, two thousand and nine. And, then, and what we did was what I think was special about Unks as well. We kept putting out mixtapes. So we'd do Unks in the coffee shop, Unks in the chalet. We'd do like the uh, fun of the Bar Rage series going on, which I did Bar Rage two. Skipper did Bar Rage three. Do you know, we did Bar Rage one on his one. So we had all this material that people are playing in the week and listening to getting into and listening to like his songs when we're stepping in the raid and saying it the crowd's singing the lyrics it's going crazy and it's like before you had Brilliant. to you know do a lot of pipe radio we had to um this was when the internet started to blow when youtube started to blow so we kind of rode that wave as well that suddenly we can just put our shit out we ain't got to worry about radio really or anything like that we just put it out and everyone's playing it in the week and they're coming to the raves and they're going crazy man and it and that's what happened with us man we've been doing things like you know, the Raveology set we did was amazing, man. That, that was a big one for us in Birmingham, which went off. You know, when we did the DMB Awards, there was just like just show after show, innovation we did in um, Stratford Rex. Unks had like, you know, some crazy, crazy shows back there, man. And um, like you said, the DMB TVs we used to do, oh, that was right. as well in terms of, you know, jumping on the internet and doing those kind of live shows. Now it's standard, but back then it was pretty new what Risky yeah. and those guys were doing. And that used to resonate all around the world. They used to go Canada and people used to say, we, can't, we play them all day those sets you know what i mean so it was powerful man it was very yeah. powerful and it really helped that kind of diy that hip-hop culture really you know kind of giving it it was giving you a platform to just have the music in your hand and access the audience and do with it what you will you didn't have to rely on pluggers you didn't have to rely on managers or promos or prs or anything like that if there was an audience out there you could put it out on the internet and i think drum and bass was really quite quick on doing that really and certainly you know with any kind of like mc culture and stuff but those those especially the dmb tv ones were just legendary you know they were legendary man and i think it what it was like the reason we meet it's, it's me and fun used to talk about this a lot it was like we'd go and do a wicked set at a rave and then we'd be like right the tape packs out or the cd pack we put it on and our mics would be so low on the cd pack you could even hardly hear our voices sometimes and we used to be so frustrated because in the rave it sounded sick so that mm. almost made us say right we've got to go studio do our own mixtape so then people can hear the bars clearly they can ride around in the week to it. And we and it was like you said, like going back to the hip hop thing, that's what hip hop guys were doing as well. Like there was back in the sort of, um, I can't remember what sort of period it was, but people like even say big guys like G-Unit and Diplomats, they would just on D-Block, they would yeah. jump on like big instrumentals at the time and put out their mixtapes and just flood the streets. 
and they became big artists off the back of that whole mixtape thing. And we were kind of doing that in drum and bass as well. We were applying that hip hop ethos of like, right, we need to be heard. So let's just get a DJ, whether it's Zen at the time or Rough Stuff or whoever, Profile, get them to do the mix. We go there, we do all our new lyrics and then we're flooding the streets with new material. And we, and we, we use that kind of hip hop ethos to do that within the drum and bass community, man. And it worked. Yeah, massively. I love that. That's a really, really strong parallel between the two cultures. And then you took it another level. And, you know, this is something else I want to explore with you is you love concepts and pushing things like, you know, kind of beyond or setting new levels. And you did that with the 12 months mixtape where, you know, you didn't just make the mixtape then or like effectively an album but wrote a book about it as well. I mean, it's that yeah. meta, meta is hell. Like the way that you kind of go inside your mind and you're talking about the whole process and where you're at emotionally and mentally, you turned yourself inside out on that one, didn't you? You properly, yeah. properly like that. I think like that's, that's something that really consolidated you as an artist and not just a performer or a rapper or a wordsmith, like writing a whole book about it and bringing the, the, the mixtape together and the book and doing it all DIY as well. I've got goosebumps now. Like, you know, that's yeah, inspiring that, man. Yeah, shit, that man. Was, that was like, you know, in life you go for a journey in it, man. And that, that particular year was a year of extreme highs and lows. Like, you, you know, the story, but just in case people don't, I lost my dad that year, man. Yeah, um, so I lost my dad, but I also got engaged that year. So it was like I was moving on in life in the family sense of actually moving on from, you know, being out here on my own all the time and just doing my thing, you know, making that commitment to someone else, but then also losing someone so important. So it was it was it was huge ups and downs going on whilst writing that mixtape. So once it once it was done and we listened back to it, it was like we should explore it further with a book, man. We should actually go deeper into these songs and talk about why it was written, how it was written, what was going on in the background when that song was written? Why is that song so like, so bloody like passionate? Or why is that song, why does that song resonate with people so much? It's because like sometimes it's heartache, sometimes it's pain, sometimes it's pure happiness, all kind of going on at once. And that's why we wrote the book because it wasn't just a collection of songs. It was literally 12 months of my life, which was another mad year of my life. You know what I'm saying? Like, like I said, very extremes, highs and lows. And that's why the book, kind of you know told and it opened up a lot of other stuff from the past as well in the book obviously because I kind of went back and spoke about the childhood and all that and yeah. it allowed me yet again to immerse myself in something just like back in the day when I was a kid listening to the speaker it allowed me to kind of it was a nice therapy you know what I mean actually put in the word oh, massively. The page as opposed to just writing the bars you know what I mean so it was definitely yeah, fun, man. yeah. and it adds a hell of a lot more kind of emotional value and meaning yeah. You know, like not every word that you say when, when, especially when you, you're cramming in so many messages and metaphors and things, not yeah. everything is going to have like real, real emotional weight. A lot of it does with you. Um, but when you're putting it in a book, like you're, you're, um, immortalizing it in a way, really, you're properly capturing the history and you're exploring your own creative process. And it was a mad time anyway. I mean, I guess like, yeah, getting engaged, but also the same year as losing your father with everything that you've been through as a kid, that really kind of drove you as a family man and kind of, kind of consolidated, put you on a path where you are now yeah. really, isn't it? And, you know, not wanting to, you know, kind of go down the same, you know, get create the same experience for your children as you had growing up and things like that. So it really makes you think forward and backwards in that type of way about who you are and what you want to do and, who you want to be in the world, I guess. Yeah, man, you, you got it spot on there, man. Do you know what I'm saying? You got it spot on. And then, and then when you have children, that's a whole other thing yeah. to kind of get into. You know what I mean? And it was like when my son was born, I literally was the busiest I've ever been in my life, music-wise, in terms of doing shows. And um, and you know, there was there's periods of my childhood where I felt very much alone, and I could have been helped more and stuff like that. It's all forgiven now. Do you know what I'm saying? But like. And I never wanted to be that person. So, you know, you're, you, I, could, I could be overseas playing the biggest festival, but backstage, like, want to just want to be home. And I, I don't want to be that dad that isn't there for his son. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like I had a lot of struggles with that during that time because yeah. of my childhood, because it spurs you on to be a better person, be a better father and all these things. And if you think you're not living up to that or you're, you're not being there, that can really mess with you inside, man. Do you know what I'm saying? Oh, hugely, hugely. Mm -hmm. I'm lucky because I get to tour and travel 
but only on my own choice and out of my own yeah, pocket. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not a performer, so I don't rely on that, but I do a lot of traveling because of my work. Yeah, but if yeah. I feel that, you know, that I need to be spending more time with my kids, I can, and it's not going to affect my income. If anything, yeah, yeah, I end course. up saving money because I'm not drinking, I'm not paying for hotels and going out, you know, that I have to invest to create my work in a way. Awesome, but for yeah. you as a performer, you need that. That is your income. That is oh. your bread and butter. So you can't make that choice. And yeah, that's, yeah. I've had so many conversations with artists on the road as since I've become a dad. Is I've I've made more friendships with DJs since I've become a dad, talking to them about their shared experiences as a parent, whether they be a father or a mother, than I did before. Because you've got this one thing that you share, and yeah, you could be having a whale of a time. You could be at the best party ever, but if you're missing your family at home and you feel like you should be there, yeah, it, it, it means nothing. Even even the amount of money that you're being paid is so it's hard to justify. So it. I, I kind of explored. I don't know if you've seen the. Um... All Stars Mike, I did for DMB All Stars. I kind of explored this whole thing lyrically and broke it down in there, man. And it was like, even writing that, it was like I was self analyzing myself. Do you know what I'm yeah, saying? Like, yeah. why was I being like that at that point? It's, oh, it's because, <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be, I don't want my child to have those, you know, those feelings I had as a child. You know what I mean? Even though he was a baby at the time, you just you overthink things because you want to be the best dad. You want to be the, you know, this thing, this the ultimate thing in your child's life and and if you think you're not doing that it can fuck with you man do you know what i mean but Absolutely. i understand it now isn't it i understand it now i understand why i felt like that at the time i understand maybe why i was short with people at the time and little things i shouldn't have done i did and things like that but you know my friends got me through it and now i understand it man and it's uh it's, it's all part of the journey man and it? it's always a learning yeah. experience it's, there's never there's always new things to learn man do you know what i mean totally. Even learn it all there's always new things Oh, massively. And now these things are out there. So, you know, at a certain age, your son is going to watch that video and he's going to know that that's all to do with him. Yeah. And it's like, you know, it's, it's almost like you've written a letter to him from the past in that it way. Is. And um, how old is your son now? And is he aware of So he's a similar age now, give or take a year, to where you were when you first heard hip hop. So uh, that must weigh on your mind in a way, like how you introduce him to music or how, what is his relationship with music? And does he understand the, what a legend his dad is? I think it's quite hard for him to understand. Like we just tell him, daddy works on the stage, daddy works at night a lot, these kind of things. But um, thanks to Raver Tots, you know about Raver Tots? Where they, oh, they, yeah, they, yeah, yeah. These amazing shows all over the country where, um, you know, they book myself, Shabba X, a few of the other guys, Fantasy, Nikki, Black Market, people like that. And um, basically parents can now bring their children to the rave experience mm. and enjoy it in that kind of atmosphere. So um, I brought him to a Raver Tots and I brought him on stage. And I met oh, wow. the whole crowd to like shout his name and stuff. And like, he, he, he's looking at me like he finally kind of got it. And there's a photo, man. I'll never forget the photo. He looked at me like, right, so this is what you do. This is what you're talking about. This is what you do. Because I always like show him about rhyming. I'm always like, what rhymes with bar? Oh, like, you know, I'm always on that, that whole thing. Like, so <laughs> Brilliant. I, I play a lot of music in the house as well. And, you know, he likes, he likes quite up-tempo music, man, which you do when you're young, isn't it? Like he likes drum and bass. He likes house, that kind of thing. He likes, he likes reggae, actually, Bob Marley, that kind of thing as well. Do you know what I mean? Those sort of things seem to resonate with him. So music's always played around the house. But I think that was the moment when he realised, oh, this is, this is what the stage is. You actually go on stage and deliver what you do to all these people and, you know, and then the next time I got him up again, and another raver talks about a year, a year after, and he was, he was, he was like brave enough to get on the mic and say hello to the whole crowd. So, oh, and it, was, like, and it was great, man. So yeah, so I think he kind of understands now. I think he's going to understand obviously more as he grows and understands how you know music works, and you know that you know that this this is like this is not just a career; it's a passion, all those sort of things as well, man. But. Yeah, it's, it, it was good, man. That whole Raver Tots thing was wicked. I never forget the photo because he, he looks at me and like, oh, he's got it. This is this is quite crazy what my daddy does. You know what I mean? Oh, <laughs> that's amazing. And that's it's such again. It's I'm in a sure responsibility. It's a privilege. It's an honor to introduce music to your children. And for yeah. me, like that was really important because it was I, my first ever memories are of my dad going through his record collection, getting his, his set together for a roller disco. He was a youth worker and effectively he was a DJ. Well, not on the level that we're talking about. He just played the latest pop tunes to people roller skating, but his passion for the music and his record collection and everything. And these are my first ever memories and it put me on this path. So I've always been really acutely aware of like, you know, if I do this in the right way, my kids could end up feeling as rich as I do from music. And, you know, you could be... Yeah it's poor you know you could have not you know literally not a penny in the bank but if you've got tunes and if you've got something to listen to 
you're rich in life really I oh think. mate trust me man that is that is the that music's like the food that's like it is it is like you know like having a bad day you put on certain records man or if you if i do a lot of running and stuff i'm running and the right wu-tang record comes on i'm running harder man it, yeah. music is the energy the source it's, it's everything i can't li- i can't not listen to music for too long because i start to get a bit pissed off i like i have to have it it's yeah. like it, it's a food it's, it's an energy it's, it's it's a source of like keeping me personally going and now a lot of people can relate to that as well it oh, isn't 100%, just, man. isn't just a commercial commodity it isn't just something for the radio it isn't just something for the background it isn't just something you play at weddings it literally is food to me man do you know what I mean? like, yeah. without yeah. it i don't know where i'd be yeah massively I, I am just a massive goosebump now like i know there's so many other things i want to talk to you about i want to talk to you about running i want to talk to you about lists because i know that you keep a list of things that you need to be listening to and stuff and yeah, if you hear things cool. like i mean I'm, I'm literally looking at a pile of lists now i work off lists whether it's to-do lists or to listen to lists or to add to my usb stick list like, you know, <laughs> all of these it, things when so much going on sometimes you need lists to get shit done man yeah yeah or just to remember the kind of music but of, of, I, I really want to kind of because there's a lot of stuff that if we haven't covered it in this podcast i need to highlight to anybody who's listening to this you've already done an amazing podcast this year with killer keller where you do cover we've covered a little bit of the similar ground but there's lots of stuff about your life on there which if anybody is hungry for more harry Sharper information and inspiration then they need to check out that podcast as well but speaking of killer keller this is definitely something that i can't not ask you about tell me all about roadblock going back to you working really really well in a group in a collaboration yeah. this is a whole other level isn't it yourself killer keller and prime cuts tell us all about yeah. roadblock and how that came together you know what man it, it, it all it all feeds into the hip-hop 50th and everything else you know you know and, and let me break it down like this i'll be honest with you man when skibbity passed i was like i'm not gonna it's like I, I was doing this thing was like I want, i'll do that project next year or i'll get to that or yeah i'll do that it, it will happen when he passed, I was like, I realised that we, we're we not all here forever, man. Do you know what I'm saying? We're not all blessed to be here forever. And I was like, I've got to stop saying I'll do that next year. Or, yeah, I'm going to do that one day. I was like, nah, I'm going to do my hip-hop stroke drum and bass live experience working with a turntableist and a beatbox and bringing all the elements together and making it super exciting and, and getting creative. I've been wanting to do this for years, so I'm going to do this now. And that's when I spoke to Keller because Keller's someone who I met and you know, sometimes you just meet people and you're just like, right, we're the same. We're the, we've got the same souls. We've got the same love for music. We're similar people in terms of the way we view life, everything else. So I know I can work with you. You know, it's just similar the same. Way. practitioners as well, I would imagine. Like the discipline, the amount of discipline that he's had to do as a vocal artist, you know, with oh. the sounds that he makes and the skills that he has. Yeah. That, you know, and I, I remember he was one of the first ever people I ever interviewed. And I remember him telling me he was copying voices off cartoons and stuff like that. And I know that that's something that you used to do as well. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, but you know that those years and years and years and hours 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 of practice. You know, you've come from that similar persistent dog-headed mindset as artists, don't you? Exactly, bro. And then when we started talking deeper, he said he he saw a picture of me because we're about me and Keller about the same age as well. He saw a picture of me when I was 14 in a hip hop magazine called Represent. And uh, he, he said to me, God, that inspired me to know that I could get in that magazine. I could do it because someone the same age as me at the time is there. Now, all these years on, we're sitting having a conversation about doing a project together. I didn't even know that. He never told me that. And I've met Killer oh, a few times, years, but he never told me that till then. And I was like, right, we've got to do this thing. We've got, we've got to do something special. We've got to do this. It's going to be for the love of the music, for the love of all the stuff we love, throwing it into one big pot. And um, I just said to him, but we 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 need the DJ man. We need we need a DJ that's got the same outlook as us, got the same sort of love of the music, history as us, um, and someone who's just one of the sickest in the game. And uh, he said, well, I'm actually doing a show with Scratch Perverts this weekend with uh, Tony Vegas and Prime Cuts. And I was like, I think I don't think Tony really DJs anymore. He goes, nah, it's a one-off show for Tony. He's not really DJing anymore. So I was like, okay, cool. Speak to Prime Cuts see if he would be down to kind of work on a project together. And I spoke to him and he said, yeah, he just wants to meet up and talk yet again. As soon as I actually sat next to this guy and spoke to him, I was like kindred spirit, man. Like, you know what I mean? Everything he was saying, his passion for the music, his love for it. You know, he was, he used to, he was at the original hip hop shows when I was too young to go. Do you know what I'm saying? He was there like representing, oh, he, you know, and, and, and the stuff he did with the scratch perverts back in the day, you know, the fact he's gone to New York and beaten the best and, you know, yeah. like with with the perverts, but also on his own. Do you know what I mean? As a solo DJ, he's won 
massive competitions and you know he respects the music the culture and everything just the same way i do the same way keller does so we're like right three of us we're all on the same page you know we've all got our own individual skill sets we can bring to the table let's just get together and rehearse and that's what we did we just we just linked up probably once a week maybe once every two weeks um, and we did that all through kind of right up until Christmas. And then, then we thought, right, we've got enough now. We've got enough material that we could kind of put together a show. And um, we spoke to Chris. We got Chris Brown, UAA. He loved the project. He got on the road. Obviously, we've done like some crazy shows. Like you said, the Jizza show. We supported Jizza. We've done the UK B-Boy Championships. We've done some amazing shows. Manchester, Nuki. We've been about, man, already. You know, even though, we've, you know, we kind of missed the festival season, unfortunately. But the reason we missed it is because we wanted to get our shit right. We didn't want to rush it out there. But next year... We're coming for you, man. Roadblock. And it's just it's just such a pleasure to be around these guys creating. You know, I love I'm, I'm a creative person. Like you said, I, you know, whether it's fun or skips, whatever else, working with these two guys, Prime Cuts and Killer Keller, they're both so inspiring and they make me up my game. You know, if, if there's a, yeah. a, a team we've worked out and um, I've got to write a 24 bar lyric or a 32 for it, I can't not have that lyric next session. I've got to come with the lyric. And it? it's, it's the pressure to be work. If we're working with the best and guys you look up to and see as your peers, you've got to, it brings your A game as well. So it's really good times for Roadblock. The way the set works when we do a proper hour set, it starts off hip hop and it builds and it goes right through this 130 tempos grind and obviously ends up in uh, in all of the love of drum and bass as well. Do you know what I mean? So it's, uh, it's a set to watch. It's a set to enjoy. And um, yeah, we look forward to doing more with it, man. Brilliant. And it pushes the technological ang um, angles as well, really, doesn't it? Like the, what you can do with the technology, certainly in terms of what Prime Cuts is doing because of what you can do now with Serato. What, you're, what the three of you are doing together that wouldn't have been possible a couple of years ago really would it that, exactly man so like just just take one example you know he'll play prime cuts will get the mr happy hazard da, 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 but he'd be cutting it up with the serato mm. stems and then keller will be doing we will take out the drums fully with the serato stems keller will be the only person doing percussion i'll be rapping on it but then we'll and then he'll bring in the uk apache hook so then we'll have the hook going in with it Aww. And then just to make it make it go even more crazy, once it like breaks down and and the and the you, normally UK Apache comes in with Serato stems, he'll take everything out, Keller stops, and then he'll literally have me just spitting on the original Nutter instrumental, which was never even available, but through the Serato stem, so you can like just have the sound, or you can just have the instrumental, or just have the vocal, or just have this or that. We can just have the drums. Then you've just wow. got me spitting on the drums. And this is all the stuff we love doing. Like, to be honest, bro, we, we, we love music and we're geeks in it. So we get to geek off and, oh, we can get that instrument on its own. And like, we just love playing with wow. it. And it, it, it works really well, man. Amazing. Amazing. And this is, we are going to wrap up with some of your innovations now, because there was another one. And I think, I think this is on ice at the moment. I'm really excited to see how it develops because I'm sure that you are going to bring this back. And I think maybe lockdown might have been a, a factor in why it didn't, but I got really excited when I read about your consequences um concept as well which is like an augmented reality rap immersive rap experience so i think like you it has been performed a little bit but it was all around like 2019 2020 and then obviously yeah. things went to shit for all of us um, and life changed but tell me all period. about that time um yeah because that was something a guy who's more in the tech scene came to me and said um he appreciates the fact that I'm, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a rapper, but he sees me as a storyteller as well. I can tell stories and all these kind of things. And would I be interested in sort of doing this augmented reality piece where I wrote a story that ends up in different ways and depending which yeah, like a choose your own adventure thing, wasn't it? It was like literally like that, man. It was so innovative, man. It was it was so ahead of its time, and I think it's something I would like to definitely look at again. Obviously, when we returned after the lockdown. I just got so busy with shows. I was so hungry to sort of get back in the studio and start doing all stuff like that. So at the moment it's kind of on ice, but it is something we could definitely look at again because, you know, that whole idea of writing a story that can end up in different ways, depending on the participant, what they choose. And through Beacon Technology, if you, you, you do you do it in a club, man, it's crazy. Like people, when I try and explain it to them, it's hard to explain, but imagine you walk in a club, you've got the headphones in, you hear this rap, you hear what's going on, there's two people arguing or talking, then it basically gives you the option to go that way and do this or that way and do that. If you go that way, this happens. If you go that way, this happens. So it's almost like you could repeat it three times in the experience to find out what happens if you did that. 
you know, what happens if I took the pill or whatever, if today that's the case, do you know what I mean? Where would I end up? What happens if I chose to ignore what's going on with the DJ and his girlfriend in the booth? What would happen? So you could do it three times over. Yeah. That was a real challenge writing that because imagine trying to write three different stories that kind of worked off the back of each other. Oh and... man. And what every time you do a different option, you suddenly open it up. It's like a family tree. It's like the multiverse, isn't it? All yeah, of these it, different it, options. Con consequences was such a like, I would say definitely a challenge, but once I got into it, it was like, right, I know what I'm doing now. Not, I kind of, I've kind of learned the science of how to work it. So I would definitely like to get that going again. Cause like you said, it was very interesting, man. And uh, it just literally, you know, we did a little um, VIP night for it just before lockdown. And there was a lot of people down there from Google and Sky. And they all saw a lot of potential in it, man. Do you know what I'm saying? And then, and then as we was about to start getting on the road and a few things, actually, bang, our world's locked down. And it's a live experience. So it kind of, by way of it being a live experience, it was like 16 months of no shows and stuff, man. Do you know what I mean? But it's definitely yeah. a concept and something that we could look at in the future for sure. I've got no doubt that you're going to bring that back. And then I'd be absolutely mad. In fact, the first time that we properly, properly spoke, I think I'd interviewed you briefly before we'd had a few interactions, but when I think about you and you know exactly where I'm going to go with this, yeah, of course, I, I broke your world record breaking story. You and did, I still can't believe I'm sitting in the same room in the same chair. It was exactly eight years ago. It was 2017. So what's that? Was yeah. It was in 2016. No, no, seven years ago. 17, I believe. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I was sitting in the, exactly where I'm sitting now. And I, um, it was Terry, Terry Hooligan from a PR company rang up and he told me about it. And he was like, yo, like, um, you know, I, I sent this to a couple of magazines, um, but they said they'll do something on it next week type of thing. And I was like, what the fuck? Like Harry Shotter is beating Eminem. I was on it straight away, like well, literally, man. like you chatting to you, chatting to Steve. I could. It's the only time ever that I've had a real viral news story. Like you know, it, I never had the UKF website melted down. That did my career and my my reputation with my employers at the time no end of benefits. Like that was that was getting messages. I mean, you were getting millions more messages, but it was crazy. I remember that the whole thing. It was like, and I remember because we um, Terry was handling the PR for it. Yeah. And I remember I was sitting in a pub garden somewhere in the country. I remember this, man. And they, and they goes like, oh, Dave from UK, if he wants to do the interview ASAP. And I was like, oh, when, man? I think it was like, he wants to do it in the next hour. I was like, all right, cool, man, let's do it. And yeah. I remember you, you on the phone, bro. Your, you, your, your passion, man. It was it was great. You were so enthusiastic. Aww. You were so on it. Do you know what I'm saying? And then and then when you broke the story, that's what when it, that's what got it viral. That was on. Whenever I talk about it, I always say it, the UKF article that you did. Yep. That's what took it viral. The Amer because at the time, you could you imagine UKF was like, you know, the pinnacle of dubstep, and then all the Americans were looking at it as well. And it was, you know, it was just right there. And it was like this big story, and it was Eminem, the biggest rapper in the world, and this UK drum and bass MC. And it was just like people were just drawn to it. And from your story, it was mad, wasn't uh, it? In America, they wrote about it. They blogged about it. Funkmaster Flex tweeted about it. Waka Flocka, T Pain, who's a huge R and B artist, yeah. put a blog up about it. They all just cottoned onto it and. I remember like, you know, the, the video we did on SBTV, I think it had about 50,000 views in the first five days. After that article, it had a million views in like two days after the article. In a week, it had a million views on their channel, man. It's amazing. It came off the back of that article, man. So thank you for being enthusiastic about it, <laughs> picking up the phone, because that was, you know, there's moments in this journey that we've spoken about and touched on today, but that was a big one, man. Can't yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. And I can believe it. Yeah, because I watched the video and said, right, this video has been out now for five days. Nobody has broken this story. So like, I love the immediacy of things. It's why I love doing internet rather than magazine stuff, because you can. If a story like this comes along, then you can just jump on it. And that's why it's like, well, okay, Mix Mag, I haven't done anything about this. DJ Mag, I haven't done anything about this. Everybody mm -hmm. seems a little bit slow. I'm getting on this. I'm the editor. I can do what the fuck I like on this website. I've been given that responsibility. This is my time to jump on it. And I think that's why I was so eager and enthusiastic, because I was thinking like, at any any moment you're going to get a call off a bigger publication who are going to want to do this and do it you know with more resources more team like you know i had no editorial budget it's like right i need to get on the phone to these guys now i need to speak to them and that consolidated a friendship with steve then which led me to co-writing a book with him and all other different book, which way, i love reading that book there's things Thanks, in man. there i knew i knew nothing about with, and i've been on the road with that guy a lot man so for you to get that out of him loved it man now the book was really enjoyable to read man i suggest anyone go out and check that out man like oh wow you know, go on you no know, nah, for real because like you got to think like that his journey is very special as well he's like gone over generations yeah. in the rave days 
to the jump up scene to like seeing it at festivals, SASAS and what he's done now. That guy's that guy's journey's very special as well. And you documented it really good, man. I really enjoyed it. I got that. so into that. I got so invested in that. And when he's telling me stuff, and I couldn't believe again, it's like, oh, there's all this stuff that I don't know. And mm. you know, it's, it's that kind of feeling like, why isn't anybody else telling your story? Why isn't anybody else writing your book? And yeah, you know, yeah, I've yeah. also done it with Ray Keefe as well now, since where when you're working with somebody that intensely and you're telling their story and you're really digging deep into their, you know, their highs and their lows and the emotional, it's, it's hard. It's heavy. Anytime I see a picture of Steve, I feel differently to how I see a picture of, well, it's only Ray and Steve because I've been on that journey with them and both books took about 18 months. You're talking to these people every single day of your life. And I mean, you've written a book yourself, you know, how intense that is when you're doing it with somebody else. It creates a, a bond that you know sometimes you don't like each other sometimes you don't want to talk to each other there were a couple right, of yeah, occasions yeah. you know where steve and i you know we had terse words with each other because you're going to likewise with ray and it's it's that magical kind of journey that you go on but yeah to go back to to the world record really i mean has there ever been any uh, i think eminem has acknowledged you in a lyric i think yeah, or acknowledged he, the, he acknowledged he the situation but i don't think he mentioned you but have you had have there been any kind of backstage incidents or anything like that have you had any oh, type no, of interactions no, with him the thing is, like with M, like Eminem, he's he's not a social media guy, so he literally talks everything that's out there about him on his albums. You know, if there's like someone who said something about him, he'll put it on the album. And um, when I was listening to the Kamikaze album, no one put me up on it. No one even told me he's like he's mentioned that he's kind of like alluded to the Animal Record on the album. I was just listening to it, and he said this lyric about um, something about I've always been a record breaker. No one could ever take my real world record. Something like that. It, it was like, and it was just like right. He actually acknowledged it. You know, he mentioned the situation. So that was enough for me. I'd love it if he would have said my name. That would have been sick, man. Do you know what I mean? Oh, Even wow. if it was... <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but no, that was, he, he definitely said something. But I can't remember the exact lyric, man. But it was something like that um, about a record breaker. No one could take my record. I've always been a record breaker. You know what I mean? So like he definitely knew about it, which is cool. You know what I mean? And um, they didn't know backstage things or nothing like that. It was just mad how like his stands was like onto it when it went viral man it was like you can't take his record and all this and it's like bro this is just hip-hop this is just fun <laughs> it's not like, there's no, there were no disrespect to him there was no disrespect no. To him. if anything he inspired it you know what i'm saying so he's massively really it's about pushing the craft pushing yourself pushing the craft pushing yourself mm -hmm. out there and just trying to be the best version of you that you can and and i think you you personify that and that is hip-hop culture that's drum and bass culture that's creative culture really and you know i think you really do embody that spirit and it's really really inspiring man oh, i love that thank you bro like just every day man i just try that's what i do every day with, with the music just try and get better man get in the studio work with new artists you know what i mean get around these youngers, man, feed off them, try and give them something they don't know. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's a two-way street. I always say if it's a two-way street, with a producer, with another artist, you know what I mean? It's all, even with the crowd, it's a two-way street, vibe off each other. That's what it is, man. Music to me isn't a secular experience. It's, it's the involvement of the community, the fan base, the whole culture, man. And that's that's why I love it. That's why I'm still a massive fan of it, bro. Do you know what I'm saying? That's why every day I'm still the biggest enthusiast, the biggest music head you'll ever find, really, man. Do you know what I mean? I just, I just, I just, this, to this day, I still love it, man. With a massive yeah. passion. Talk to people like you, share that passion. You know, you obviously you're a journalist, we're in different fields, but the passion is shared and it's always good to talk to like minded people and, uh, get these thoughts out there man and hopefully inspire the next generation to come and like keep it moving you know what i mean fingers crossed man we're doing our best aren't we we're doing our best i'm literally sizzling in goosebumps um i can't wait to interview you again already thank you so much for two, taking man. the time to chat and yeah we'll definitely do a part two and a part three and i look forward to seeing you in the dance really soon man from one massive music fan to another big the fuck up thank you so much man big respect sir salute man